That's great, Bill. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I'd like to go ahead and pose a few questions now to kind of follow up on some of the things that you discussed. Uh, today we're discussing natural capital and, and some of the career opportunities uh, that are available in the extension service. Uh, and now, like you said in your presentation, extension now is no longer just about plows and cows. I've never heard that expression. That's very nice. I'm going to have to remember that. Um, but I'd like to discuss four different areas with you uh, that I think will really inform some of our viewers and some of the people who are considering a career in this space uh, as they look at some of the trends that are involved. So the four areas are, you know, first of all, what's driving demand uh, for um, uh, for people who are going into this career? Uh, what are some of the dem demographic changes that are driving that demand? Uh, and then stakeholder relations and how do we get the knowledge out to the people so that they so that they can use it? Uh, and then also the the financing and the investing part of this as well. So let's start a little bit with about the demand for these services and what are some of the big issues that are driving demand for people to be uh, in these careers and the services that are being demanded by the market good question i think i maybe i could get a little more clarification on that lauren the demand for um, people in the profession right the demand for the services specifically that people who are going into extension service are going to be able to fill Okay, well, um, there's so many different levels, I guess, and, and ways to answer that question. But I think uh, if someone is interested, uh, well, let's just take the county agent level. If someone is interested uh, in uh, becoming a county agent, usually they would work in a small office with two or three others. Um, they would be uh, either hired on as an agricultural and natural resource agent, a family and consumer science agent, or a 4-H uh, and youth development agent. There's a few other newer areas in, in many counties and in many states. And for example, in, in Florida, there are actually sustainability agents. They're looking at um, you know, sustainable systems um, across the board. There are, there are climate change agents. And so there's a lot of, a lot of this demand for, for people to come into these positions. And so, if I'm answering your question correctly, there there is a huge, huge demand for the young natural resource or the young extension uh, agent from a lot of different areas. At the state level, um, again, that's an A to Z demand level. Um, there are needs from um, the, the traditional agricultural arena, such as pests and, and diseases. There's also um, demands for uh, food system. Uh, studies more and more of these demands are, are are integrated. So you would come on not being an expert in uh, a very narrow field like um, um, you know uh, pole bean production, but you would come in and work with a series of other specialists that um, would solve a big food issue. And so that's uh, that's a changing demand for today's uh, today's uh, I'm sorry today's young professional. And what type of backgrounds do you see people coming into these positions now? Do they have a very wide, varied background with, uh, you know, liberal arts or business or finance or science, biology, that sort of thing? Or, or do you see a greater demand for people with a diverse range of backgrounds? Another great question. I think um, there are model universities that are beginning uh, to look for uh, professionals with that with that wide variety, that, that diverse background, uh, marketing specialists, sustainability specialists, communication specialists, uh, but there's still a very, very strong demand for some of the traditional um, specialists and, and professionals, those that receive training in agriculture, receive training in environmental or food systems and these kinds of things. So we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater by any means, but uh, we're still a very strong agricultural organization, most agents and specialists that are hired are, are have an agric agricultural background, but anybody um, nowadays really can, can work with the extension service. There's so many different unique positions out there. That's great. You know, it's, it's very interesting to consider when you're dealing with the food system is that you know, a lot of people, again, they think of food and they think of plows and cows, but there's so much more to it than that. There's transportation elements, there's energy, uh, there's uh, natural resources when we're talking about water, there's marketing and, uh, and business to, 
to let people know about the food. Uh, so there are a little, a lot of different opportunities there for people with different backgrounds to go into agriculture and the extension services, and that would be a gateway for people to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. So uh, another question for you and that I know is of great concern to a lot of people uh, in the agricultural sector is the demographic challenge uh, that is being faced by the agricultural space. Uh, like you said during your presentation, we've actually flip-flopped, you know, with a number of people who are actually living in cities now rather than living out in the countryside. Uh, so there seems to be a lot less of the passing on of traditional knowledge uh, that you might see in communities. Uh, and so another demographic challenge is that most of the farmers are retiring and uh, there are not enough young farmers to take their place. Uh, how is the extension program dealing with that issue? And do they have any plans to, uh, to address that? Yep, they sure do. There's uh, there's the demographics of the of the client uh, that you're talking about, our stakeholders, our farmers, our landowners. <clears throat> excuse me. And then there's also the demographics of the people that we hire. Uh, but uh, primarily of the stakeholders, that is exactly what's going on. We've got the farmers retiring. Their children aren't necessarily interested in uh, in carrying on the family farm. <clears throat> so there's a number of different programs. Just to use that as an example. Um, dealing with estate planning, dealing with uh, transferring the family farm to to others, and those have been very successful. And so, so we're changing with the times by developing new programs. And some of these actually um, end up really uh, having a very positive force on the land and the farmers. Uh, some farmers' children that uh, at first did not want to uh, get into the field have come through some of these programs and decided that uh, they need they need they'd like to stick around and, and manage the farm so that was just one example of the changing demographics and how we're dealing with those and another one as i mentioned was um, urban forestry and dealing with more and more of the urban community uh you mentioned that you had a professor that said you know we have the internet now and you said that stung a little bit i can under understand why uh, but I also think you came up with the right answer there and the right conclusion is that now you need extension programs and that one-on-one -on -one interaction more than ever. Uh, because the nature of the internet, of course, is that information has, in a way, become commoditized. That, the role of stakeholder relations and specifically the concept of knowledge brokerage, okay, and how we actually transfer the knowledge that, are, that is needed using technology to the people who need it most. Uh, so, from a technology point of view, is the extension service looking into those areas of, UV, of using data and analytics and technology as a way to transfer knowledge from, you know, the people who are working in extension to the people on the ground? And, and how would you say that younger people are playing a role in that as well? Yes, um, the answer is yes to all of that. Uh, extension is using new technologies. They're using uh, bigger and bigger data sets. They are using a lot more of what we call targeted marketing. And so that rather than just um, blasting the information out to the world, we spend more time understanding who our clients are, who our audiences are, so that we can directly target information to them. So that's, that's one way that we're doing it. Um, you yeah, know, big data is a big issue. We know that. Um, how we handle that, how we use it, uh, we're all still learning, um, but we're able to customize this information uh, much better now than, than we could in the past and design extension programs to have a real impact. Again, in the old days, we would blow out a large, uh, have a big workshop, a big farmer um, technology day and be done with it. A um, lot of different technologies today now to follow up with farmers, to follow up with urban residents, to follow up with our stakeholders, to make sure we've got impact and that we're working together on finding common solutions. Yeah, what I'm hoping is that a lot of the interactive technologies uh, can be very useful in almost recreating that sort of uh, wisdom transfer, I'd like to call it. Uh, information is easy, but wisdom is more difficult. And that's something that's passed down generation to generation, specifically in local context. So. Uh, what I hope to see is that with interactive technologies such as Google Hangouts that we're using now, uh, we can essentially recreate 
that knowledge brokerage concept uh, to where we have people passing down information mouth to mouth and in face to face conversations. So, uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you about is the business and finance part of this. Um, during in you know this spring, Green Leaders DC is discussing natural capital. Um, now, natural capital in some ways is a bit of a controversial issue, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it essentially says that you know we should try to put a financial value on some of the ecosystem services that the environment provides to us. Let me ask you a little bit about that. What is the extension services uh, approach to natural capital? Uh, do you use any sort of uh, finance and investing concepts uh, when you're dealing with farmers uh, on the ground through your different programs? Okay, so if I understand the question, we might be talking about um, carbon accounting, for example, or ecosystem services, quantifying those, those services. That's correct, exactly. Okay, yes, all those are incorporated. Uh, we work very closely with um, nonprofits and non governmental uh, environmental organizations. Uh, so there is a very big push to incorporate natural capital into our extension programs. We work, obviously, we're, we don't work in a vacuum. And so a lot of these organizations and agencies that we have typically dealt with, they usually do the research, they'll usually push for the public policy changes. And then we'll uh, we'll assist them getting the information out, connecting with stakeholders, uh, doing what we call needs assessments, doing what we call stakeholder analyses, um, you name it, and then develop those targeted marketing materials that, that would help help people understand what natural capital is at for you know at the basic level, and then how they might um, incorporate it into their their farming schemes or or landowner schemes and these kinds of things. So huge area, no doubt. Okay. And uh, what about the in investor side of things? I mean, funding, obviously, for a lot of these programs is very important. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, increase in the value of farmland um, um, in recent years, uh, particularly in the Midwest and some other places as well. Uh, do you have um, uh, relationships with the business and the financing, the investor community? And, and what are some of their interests that you know people going into this career might have to take account of when they're dealing with that stakeholder class? Ooh, that's a that's the toughest question I've I've received yet, Lauren. And um, I would have to say I just don't know enough about that. Uh, I do work closely with uh, private industry, uh, particularly the forest industry, and we have programs such as the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, which is really trying to work uh, and invest in sustainability to do a better job of managing the lands. Uh, but as far as the whole business and finance end of of investment um, in that arena, I'm just not, I'm just not familiar with that. My apologies. So, okay. Well, uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'd like to thank Bill Hubbard. He's coming to us from Georgia today at the Southern Regional Extension Forestry. Uh, Bill, thanks a lot for your perspectives today and your presentation. Uh, for those of you watching today, we'll be posting this video on YouTube, so stay tuned for that. So I'd like to. Thank